Reporter at Bloomberg here uh, welcoming to you to a live chat with our tech reporter, Mark Gurman. He covers all things consumer tech with a specific focus on Apple. So a big day for Apple and for Mark today. Uh, Mark, welcome to, to uh, the chat today. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Great to talk to everyone and get everyone's questions. Obviously, it was a exciting uh, morning for Apple fans like myself. People yeah, so all, all day about it. So I'd love to, you know, dive in to, you know, get some thoughts out. Great. Before we dive in, I want you to tell everyone about your Power On newsletter because if they're watching this live stream, they're probably interested in everything you have to say in that newsletter. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So Power On, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, every Sunday uh, comes out around 1 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific goes through the week's news, there's scoops and tidbits, everything about Apple and other consumer tech companies. I had a little preview of the event uh, today on the Sunday newsletter. There was a little review I had of the Ray-Ban spectacle copy or whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, please subscribe. It's growing really quickly and really uh, well. People are loving it and you can sign up. It's in my bio on Twitter. You click the link, you can sign up there. There's also a landing page on Bloomberg.com under the newsletter section. Uh, yep. under the tech panel. Bloomberg.com newsletters, excuse me, Bloomberg.com slash newsletters if you want to find Mark's email newsletter, Power On, and all of our other newsletters. I'll put a plug in too if you're a Bloomberg.com subscriber. You get Power On early and you get full access to Q&A with Mark every week, not just in this live stream, but every week. So check that out. Mark, let's talk about the event today. What are your What's your initial reaction to it? Oof. Okay. So it's a bit of a muted event, right? I mean, I called for Apple to call the new phone, the iPhone 13, but truth be told, it's uh, it's closer to a 12S. They made the camera diagonal on the 13 and 13 mini. So I guess that's a design change. The notch is 20% narrower, so not significantly narrower, but overall, these are, are small upgrades. They're not even saying how much faster the processor is. Uh, that's because I believe it's pretty much on par, just slightly faster uh, than the A14 last year. Um, I thought the Apple Watch situation was pretty interesting where they did not give a release date for the Apple Watch. They basically said it'd be coming later this fall. That's because there are some pretty significant production delays uh, and some design changes and other uh, tweaks over the course of the, the product's development over the last several months. Uh, the new iPads, the iPad mini, just as expected, basically a shrunken down iPad Air, iPad Pro. I think that's going to do really well and people are going to be quite excited about that. Uh, I don't like the new color of the new phone, the Sierra Blue. I wish there was like a matte black or a, a darker slate color. Uh, I guess I'm going graphite this year. I have the quote unquote Pacific Blue right now. It looks pretty much like the graphite, but I think I'm going to go for um, the, the graphite this year. Um, Apple Watch, bigger screen as expected. It's about a two inch display. It's specifically it's a 1.92 inches on the diagonal much higher resolution, 16% more pixels, but 20% more screen area. I think that's gonna allow for much better watch faces and apps. Apple finally needs to allow people to release their own watch faces or developers to make watch faces to take advantage of that display. So I think there's a lot more to, to come throughout the year as well. And uh, the subtle event kind of muted, you were describing it earlier, not a lot of big design changes. What do you think that means for the general consumer of someone who isn't following uh, the, to think to the pixel so precisely? I don't think it means anything, honestly. I think that the redesign for the iPhone last year was fairly significant. You'll get a big new design next year. Uh, so I think this this just makes sense as part of their two to three year design cycle where they keep the, the, the same design. It actually would have been abnormal if Apple were to change the iPhone design again after just changing it last year. I also think it's pretty cool that the phones are just shipping. I mean, they're going on pre-order on Friday, so in a couple of days. And then they're going to start shipping uh, on the 24th, so about 10, 11 days from now. Last year, not, was a several week delay. So not surprising that we didn't see a big design un unveil today. Did anything surprise you? Uh, did anything surprise me? Not necessarily. I mean, I think we got a lot of the features on the money uh, in terms of the new watch functionality. Uh, obviously, uh, as you've seen, the the, the watch casing is rounded like the current model, not flat uh, like I, I discussed. I anticipate that having been a design change due to the complexity that comes with that or a design that they're going to utilize in a future generation. But of course, as everyone saw, they're uh, rounded 
uh, again this year, even <laughs> they're actually even a little bit more rounded than the current ones. Um, mm -hmm. That new glass that they're using on the top of the display, the crack resistance, I think is going to be helpful. I can't tell you how many times I've knocked the watch into like a doorknob or something or the corner of a table and shattered the screen. So, you know, hopefully that, you know, that stands, that stands up to what Apple's marketing uh, machine is saying it will do. Yeah, let's stay on the watch for a second. I know um, some some health updates. Not nothing really big happened in the health update space. Do you see anything happening there? Maybe in the next release? Yeah. So, like as we said, would be the case. There's really nothing new on the health side of the watch. Certainly disappointing, given that you know they're pushing this as a health device, right? Next year will be a thermometer feature. Probably in two or three years, there'll be the blood pressure feature. And I still think the time horizon on glucose is at least five years out. But those are the those are the three big ones, right? Thermometer, blood pressure, glucose. The goal is to hit all three. They will. It's just a matter of time. But the most imminent one a year from now will be the uh, thermometer, which probably would have been very handy over the last year and a half due to uh, COVID, right? But it's that's a great point. Yes. Yeah. Is there any competitor that's on their heels? You talk about a five line, a five year time horizon. That feels like forever in this space. Is anyone going to catch up to them before that? See, Apple is the smartwatch market, right? They own well over half the market. There is 100 million of them at least in use. Nobody comes close. Apple is so far ahead in smartwatches that I don't really particularly think it's worth anyone even attempting to come close. It's just not going to happen. But I think Apple eventually should do don't know if they're going to do it, but they need to break the ties completely from the iPhone at some point, whether that's creating a mechanism where you can buy the watch off a shelf and set it up without ever needing to pair it to an iPhone, which by the way, with the bigger screen is now easier because of they now have the, the flick type like keyboard on there where you can actually put an password if necessary. Fine. Mm -hmm. Right or make it compatible with Android, release an Apple Watch app for Android. One of those two things needs to happen to really unlock the watch. And until uh, until they do that, the addressable market is limited to how many people have iPhones. Huge market, obviously, yeah. but if you want to loosen that a little more, you got to uh, make some changes on, 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 on delinking. Uh, sure. From You've reported that, that uh, about half the company's revenue is from the phones, though. So do you think they're hesitant to decouple the watch from the phone in that way? Um, I don't think so. I don't think the Apple Watch drives iPhone sales. I think it's vice versa. So unlinking the two, I don't think would have a, a negative financial impact. If anything, uh, it would be it would it, it would be quite uh, positive, I think, uh, overall. I, I'm seeing we're getting a ton of questions here on on Twitter. We should let's go ahead and take some. Yeah, let's take a few. Though. So one question from Jonas underscore 1799, he asks, any ideas when the Apple Watch will be released? That's a good question. When was the last time you've seen Apple release an iterative update to a product, right? And not give a release time, frame, right? Even last year when there was the multi-week iPhone delay, they gave specific timing. They're not doing it this time because of those major production delays and some of the changes they had to make later in development. I would guess these are coming out in November, right? If it was coming out in October, they would say so. I'll go further than that. I would say they don't even know if it's coming out in November. It could be coming out in early December. So I think the horizon on there is unfortunately two months or so. I really want to get my hands on that bigger screen. So, Do you uh, think some of those challenges are, are specific to Apple or are they bumping into the, the broader issues we're seeing with global supply chain at the moment? I mean, there is a broader supply chain issue, but this is not related to the chip shortage or, or anything like that. This is mostly related to the screen and issues producing the actual displays. So I wouldn't put it in the same category as the chip shortage. Speaking of chips, I did find it very interesting that Apple ended up not explaining um, what processor is inside of the new watches, right? You would think it would be like mm -hmm. an SF chip, but they didn't disclose it. In fact, if you go to Apple's website on the new watch, they don't really disclose anything about the watch. You kind of have to dig around Apple's website to see, um, you know, the 41 and 45 millimeter configurations, some of the other new features. Um, another question I'm getting here is, where is astrophotography and always on display? The cameras are very capable for astro, but have they intentionally skipped it? So I don't believe astrophotography was ever planned to come to this year's uh, iPhone. When I wrote about the new camera features about a month or two ago, I heard, heard there's only three new features, specifically the camera. Uh, cinematic mode, which is portrait mode for video, as you saw mm -hmm. them 
really dive into in the keynote. Photographic styles, which is like a new AI-based filter system to adjust skin tones more naturally based on the other items and colors in the photo. Uh, and then the third thing was ProRes video recording. So I had never heard that astro photography was in, so I don't think that was ever a plan. However, there are different modes and different apps you can use because the hardware is capable of that. So I'm sure you'll see a lot of third-party apps pushing that. Uh, always on display. Yeah, I had never heard that always on display was, was coming to the phone. What I had heard is that the screen hardware would enable such functionality. So it's unclear when that feature would arrive. Perhaps it's next year or the year after. But that is certainly something, given the higher refresh rate, that could be accomplished uh, on that new phone, just like it could be done uh, on the watch. Uh, what other questions are we getting here? I've got one here from Yusuf who says, hi, Mark, I just want to hear your latest info on the mini LED MacBooks. Is Apple announcing them soon? Yeah, so they should probably be announced uh, in the next month or so. I heard they are several weeks away, so we'll see them probably late October, early November. Oof, these have been delayed time and time again. These were supposed to come out in June and July and in September. They kept pushing back. I personally think it's a mix of problems related to the chip shortage. Obviously, mm -hmm. new processors and a complete redesign coming to this machine. And then also the mini LED is creating a ton of complexity in the supply chain. Like we saw with the iPad Pro, the new ones earlier this year, which also has mini LED on the 13-inch model. So I think you're seeing similar challenges in production uh, for those as well. Uh, what other questions are we getting here? Hold on, I'm seeing a lot on Twitter. Let me find some good ones. While Mark's scrolling on Twitter, I'll remind everyone to sign up for Mark's newsletter, Power On. It's coming to you every Sunday. All these uh, inside scoops on Apple and all things consumer tech. You can go to bloomberg.com slash newsletters to find Power On and all the rest of our suite of newsletters coming from Bloomberg. And Mark, if you want to take another one here from the stream while you're searching for Twitter, how about that? We've got one from, you can't unhear this, this is the screen name. Would you recommend someone with an iPhone 12, not pro, upgrade to a 13? An iPhone 12, not pro to a 13. Okay, so here, here's my theory on that. If you're able to get a new iPhone without paying any money out of pocket up front, without increasing your monthly payment if you're on an installment plan, and without needing to run a credit check, right? If it's not gonna cost you anything, I don't see the reason. If you're an iPhone fan and you really want the new device, not to get it. Now, when you have to start shelling money out of pocket, when you have to start selling your phone on eBay, when you have to start doing trade-ins, when you have to do a credit check through the iPhone upgrade program, that creates complexity that may, it may you know, give me or someone else some pause to upgrade. But all things equal, I don't see the point not upgrading, right? But going a little deeper. This is not that big of an upgrade, right? If it is going to cause you a headache in any shape or form, probably better off waiting to the 14. What I did see though, were some pretty good uh, carrier deals. Like for example, this T-Mobile deal. So I'm on the Magenta Max plan through through T-Mobile. I have an iPhone 12 Pro Max. So what they're saying is I could get up to 1250 for my phone, um, mm -hmm. $800 in cash coming from Apple, the rest coming in bill credits from T-Mobile. Essentially, if I go from the 12 Pro Max to the 13 Pro Max through T-Mobile, it's not gonna cost me anything, right? And I think that's gonna be the case for a lot of people. So it's just- Sounds like you have to write a post about how to, to get all these hacks to get around it. That might be useful to, to folks asking the same question out there. Stay tuned to Power On this weekend. But yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> if you really do a little bit of research and crunch some of the numbers, Sometimes I like to pull out an Excel spreadsheet for these things. You can probably get the new device without paying anything, very little at most. The thing that worries me, though, is that some of these upgrade programs require credit checks. I had a friend who had like did the iPhone uh, 10, right? And he didn't upgrade to the iPhone 11 because he didn't feel the jump from the 10 to the 11 was worth the credit check. So there might be a lot of people who just don't want the to their credit score to maybe be adjusted a little bit because of needing a credit check, right? But the credit check situation is dependent on which upgrade plan you have. That I think is related to Citizens Bank with the iPhone upgrade program through Apple, but there might be other plans like the Apple Card plan that doesn't really uh, impact your credit score. I have another good question coming in here from Sean, SG9-4920. What are your thoughts on the Global Store rumors now following the event and lack of reference to Global Store? So if you remember my story from a few weeks ago on the satellite functionality coming to the device 
or coming to the iPhone eventually. We said this would be for future iPhones. We said it would not be announced this year. That's exactly what happened, right? So maybe there's satellite hardware tucked in to the iPhone 13 itself, but the functionality won't be coming till next year. Global Star seems like a likely partner, given that Iridium and some of the other satellite companies have either said they're not involved with Apple or uh, don't have the technology to do it. Global Star, hearing a lot of negative things about them, but it seems like they're the most capable at this point. Uh, they've been filing with the SEC documentation saying they've been getting investments for an upcoming service or product from a secret provider and whatnot. So it all adds up that it could be Global Star, but I think the iPhone satellite story is a little too early. Uh, but what I will say is this is not something that you'll be able to use to call your friend on a mountain. Mm -hmm. This could be for, God forbid, if you're in a uh, disaster, a plane crash, a, a car crash, a boating accident in the middle of nowhere without cellular connectivity, that's what this is going to be for. Obviously, it's a niche feature, but there's some people who were in those situations. Yeah. I've got another one here from David Sada who says, when can we expect an in-screen fingerprint sensor or will Apple not move on from Face ID? Yeah, I think Face ID is still the future. There was a period at the beginning of the pandemic where Apple was discussing internally the need to probably move to Touch ID uh, mm -hmm. because of masks, but then they added the software functionality to better deal with masks. Um, I believe there will be in-screen Face ID in the next two or three generations. Maybe for the lower end models, they'll do in-screen Touch ID instead or relegate it to the display, or sorry, to the, to the power button. So I think in-screen Face ID is probably more promising at this point than in-screen Touch ID. Um, the benefits of having Face ID over Touch ID are tremendous. Obviously, you get the AR component. Uh, you get emojis, you get emojis, you get better authentication. Obviously, Face ID is more secure to some extent because of the variables you have in your face versus what you just have in your phones. So mm -hmm. there's a lot. So, uh, How about some from Twitter? <clears throat> let's see. Um, so we have someone, LK Ryder, saying he's really disappointed uh, that there is no in-screen touch ID. I, I've heard that from a lot of people. I mean, because of the mask situation, people want yeah. to unlock their devices uh, with their thumbs. Mask plus sunglasses, forget it. Yes. Um, okay, another question coming here. What about AirPods? So Apple, their production ramp for the new AirPods has started. Um, there will be another event next month. So it seems likely to me that the new AirPods would probably hit uh, alongside that. Another possibility, last year they sort of capped off the year and released the AirPods Max headphones right before Christmas. I could totally see Apple saving the regular AirPods for Christmas time as sort of like a last product launch of the year, stocking stuffer type of gift. So I could definitely foresee that, but I would say for sure uh, before the, the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, we got more questions coming in from Twitter. Why no USB-C? Why no matte black? Why no always on? Why no improved battery on the Watch 7? Where is the stainless steel Watch 7? Why do they still sell the Watch 3 and the iPhone 12? Okay. A lot of questions. A lot of Good questions. one. But I like <laughs> Good one to start with. I like all of these. I'm going to start with the last question. Why do they still sell the Watch 3 and the iPhone 12? Uh, I don't know. I don't think they should sell the, the, the Watch 3. I mean, the, it's become sluggish, barely functional for some people. Uh, I think they should definitely uh, not sell that anymore. I can foresee them when they launch the Apple Watch SE2 next year, keep the current Apple Watch SE, move that down in the line to replace the Series 3 watch. The iPhone 12, that makes sense. Of course, they're going to continue selling the iPhone 11. You don't want to leave that gap. Now they have the 11, 12, 13. I did see a steel watch on Apple's website. Why no improved battery in the Watch 7? Uh, I think it's too early to tell. They haven't released any specs on the Watch 7. Clearly, there's something up. And I totally agree with you on the matte black iPhone and the USB-C. It doesn't make much sense to me that if you've seen in my Power On newsletter that the iPads, all the iPads at this point other than the entry level, the Mac, all USB-C, but the phone is still lightning. It's kind of absurd. It's time to either switch to USB-C or remove the plug altogether, I think. Definitely want yeah. to have a phone as well. Talk about that a little more. I thought that was a really interesting piece that you wrote. We're just getting into the, the complexities of having so many different devices that, that aren't all using the same charger. And now we're talking about new products coming out and the future of this. Where do you see it going? Uh, I see them going completely wireless. The end goal is to have 
uh, a situation where all your devices can recharge each other. They want to move to MagSafe. The MacBook Pro is going to move back to MagSafe next month uh, or in November. The phone has MagSafe. The iPad Pro will be getting MagSafe uh, next year, the glass back. Eventually, they're going to transition everything over to wireless charging, and they're developing mechanisms so your iPad can charge your phone, your phone can charge your AirPods, your AirPods case can charge your watch, right? They really want to make everything be able to charge each other and have one unified ecosystem of uh, charging. Um, I see we're getting tons of questions in here now. Um, let's see. Uh, hi, Susie. Mark, does it still make sense to get the iPad Air 4 over the iPad Mini 4 because the new i processor, the new features like center stage, or wait for the Air 5? Oof. Well, all things equal, an Air 5, if it adds center stage and then A15 and the new front camera, it would be identical to the iPad Mini, and the only difference is screen size. So the iPad Mini is what the new one is, what, 8.3 inch diagonal, and the iPad Air, I think it's 11, right? Or 10.9, 10.9 or 11. Anyways, close enough. It's your choice. They're getting pretty close between the iPad mini and the and the phone screen sizes. So I think that's going to mm -hmm. be to put the Pro Max and the new iPad mini uh, side by side. For me personally, I always prefer the larger display, but I can tell you, I loved the iPad mini back in the day. It's just become pointless for me with the Pro Max. I went down to the smaller phone size and I was worried about giving up beautiful screen, but I can hold it and do things with one hand again. So I really appreciate that. I mean, that, that is a huge benefit. The SE is way too small for me, though. Um, okay, what do you think of the video capabilities and the upgrades there? Are they enough to make a large group of people, a large section of people upgrade? Honestly, I don't think so. ProRes video recording is so limited in terms of the people who are really going to take advantage of it. Uh, what I'm told is when you record a ProRes video, it's going to fill up your onboard storage mm. pretty dang quickly. So... If you're going to do ProRes, you're going to want to get a higher storage capacity um, iPhone. I don't see the so you, you don't see that changing all of our Instagram feeds to, to look to a different aesthetic, that kind of thing. It's going to be a little uh, bit further out of their reach than a general consumer. Yeah, I think it's going to be incredibly niche. These are the, This is for the people who are trying to shoot movies and commercials on iPhones for whatever reason. Um, mm -hmm. I do think the portrait mode for video, uh, cinematic video is pretty dang cool. But again, why wasn't that? available in a software update for last year's phone because they want to sell the new phones, right? I mean, I think it's, I always think it's so odd when they when they try to sell the new devices using software features that would work just as well on last year's hardware, but it is what it is, right? They're a $2 trillion company and uh, it's their responsibility to not, uh, you know, go into the can, right? Yeah, I've got um, another one here from Dan Deeth who says, have you, uh, do you ever see Apple getting into making first party home kit accessories? such as security cameras like Nest? I do. I think that is something they're absolutely working on. It's going to be quite a while before they launch it, but it, they definitely have a team working on smart home devices, right? The way to really bump up your own ecosystems is to make a product as part of your ecosystem. If you remember before the Apple Watch came out, they were pushing health syncing and functionality using health kit. Home kit, they've done the home pod and the Apple TV, but Nest is very successful or under Google now. Amazon has all those devices. So I think you'll see Apple try to compete at the very high end of the smartphone or sorry, the smart home uh, accessories market. Uh, I'm getting some more questions here on Twitter. Thoughts on the iPad mini plus iPhone mini versus the Pro Max. So I think this person is asking, should I get an iPad mini and an iPhone mini? both of those, mm -hmm. or Pro Max, which would sort of be in the middle and pay the same price. My initial reaction would be, why have two devices when you can have one that basically accomplish the same thing? So for my money, I'd probably get the Pro Max and not carry around two devices. Do you think this is getting too complex for the average consumer that there's there's too many devices that, as you were saying, the kind of sides of the spectrum of size are, are starting to meet? And what, what's that like keystone device going to be that you don't know if it's an iPad mini or a large phone? What's what, Is there too much proliferation there? I think there's a lot of devices. I think there's a lot of consumer choice. To me, the ultimate Apple device would be a foldable iPhone uh, Pro Max that unfolds to the screen size of 
the iPad mini. So imagine a device that is about the size of this mm -hmm. and then you can hold it and it becomes the size of like a small iPad, right? Well, the, the 90s are cool again. So flip phones might be the answer that we've all been waiting for. I think Samsung was absolutely onto something. I had the first fold. If uh, anyone watching this remembers, unfortunately, my or I, I discovered, unfortunately or not unfortunately, a huge flaw with the phone where if you unpeeled the screen protector, which by the way, they don't tell you, they didn't tell you to unpeel in that, in that model, uh, destroyed the whole phone. Anyways, whatever. But like, that would be cool. Like if Apple did a foldable, I, I think that would be one of the most popular Apple devices ever. Uh, obviously there would be some cannibalization there, but you know, as Apple likes to say, we'd rather cannibalize ourselves and have Samsung do it. By the way, I think Samsung is doing the right thing by going all in on foldables. You're going to see so many more foldables from them. I think they're they're doing a great job. Um, some more questions I'm, I'm, I'm getting here. What features can make it a worthwhile upgrade from the AirPods Pro to AirPods Pro 2? Okay, so AirPods Pro 2 next year, a uh, couple things. They've been testing a shorter stem. Unclear if they're going to ultimately go with that design because those are still quite a ways away. Other thing is fitness tracking. So maybe monitoring your sweat in your ear or monitoring heart rate from your ear. I guess the eventual goal is to put cellular in the AirPods, right? And make them a standalone mm -hmm. device, just like the watch. I think that's going to be a decade away though, but the future for the AirPods is it's pretty clear to me. Uh, some people call them an ear computer. I think it's absolutely a stretch and that's PR spin to some extent, uh, but definitely something there on the very, very long term, hopefully. Tell us more about that. Um, uh, for those, those of us who can have a hard time imagining, how do you even interact with your AirPods to, to more of a degree than you already do with? I'm always trying to tap the thing and it's not working and that's my experience. So, but you're talking about going even beyond that. Yeah, so putting onboard storage, putting cellular, putting the ability to make phone calls, essentially being able to leave home without the watch or the phone and control everything through the AirPods, right? I mean, people thought it was unimaginable that the small little Apple watch was able to get cellular back four years ago, you know, wouldn't be surprised if they could eventually jam in cellular into the AirPods themselves, especially now that they're working on their own modems and such, they have more flexibility to develop the hardware alongside the modem, alongside the software. Whereas right now they're very reliant on Qualcomm and other partners to basically shoehorn in uh, the modem designs that these phone or the, the Qualcomm and others, MediaTek and such have uh, created in the past themselves. A few more from the Twitter stream. Let's see. We're getting. Uh, when do you expect the announcement of an Apple car? Oof, 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 oof. Mm. So I'm sure you saw Doug Field, who ran the Apple car project from a hardware perspective. Uh, he bolted for Ford. Very interesting. Like, wouldn't you think that if you ran the Apple car project for the biggest company in the world and you were successfully able to take that project from, from inception to launch, you would make your legacy big time. Don't you think that if Doug Field felt that he was able to actually do that, he would have stuck around for it? Uh, I certainly think so. Instead, he went to Ford, right? Ford doesn't necessarily have the greatest reputation uh, in the in the EV world, in the technology world. So he left the iPhone maker behind for Ford. I don't think it's a great look. And now they put Kevin Lynch in charge, the only guy at Apple who's successfully brought new hardware and software product, the Apple Watch, uh, to market. So I think this is still very much a software story. Uh, to answer your question, Pascal, I don't think they're going to announce an Apple car within the next five years. I think the the horizon on that project is seven to ten years. It's it's quite it's quite a ways away. Um, yeah, if you were talking about earlier about the the next watch, really, or the, some of the health capabilities not even being for five years, and you're talking about jumping to an entire vehicle, it does seem like you'd have to double or triple that timeline. Probably. Uh, when could we see an Apple foldable that doesn't cost thousands of dollars? Are there any barriers besides cost? I don't think cost is really a factor for Apple. The iPhone 12, sorry, 13 Pro Max, the top end now, I think I saw a $1,600. So I don't think Apple would blink twice to release a $2,200 foldable iPhone. And I don't think a lot of, cons I don't think there's a lot of consumers who will blink twice to buy it. So I don't think price is the issue. I think it's a technical issue. I think it's how you can make the screen not have a crease. I think if Apple launches a foldable, they're going to want it to be basically bug free. So like there's three generations of the Samsung Fold already. It'll probably get perfect by the fifth generation, right? Apple wants perfect on generation one. 
So I think that's the holdup there. Definitely, they're reliant on third parties like Samsung for screen technology. And so Samsung mm-hmm. is not able to get the screen perfect even for itself. What are the chances they're going to get the screen perfect for Apple? It's very slim. So I would say two or three years. Any plans on Apple returning to a large HomePod or a sound bar for the Apple TV? I think Apple's finding that even their $99 HomePod mini, which, by the way, is just as loud as an iPad speaker system, I don't even think that's selling particularly well. Uh, their next big thing in the home is sort of this merged HomePod and Apple TV and FaceTime device. We'll see how that does. But, like, it's incredible to me how Apple has completely failed at every home device they've ever launched uh, by by any metric, whether that's a financial metric, a customer satisfaction metric, tons of issues there. The HomePod you, original HomePod sounded great, but the functionality was so limited. Do you think that'll change coming out of this this year, two years uh, coming up on now that we've all been home so much more? Do you think that they they will focus in on this and having to get it right, seeing this is a big missed opportunity in the last 18, 20 months? I think they know it's a missed opportunity, but I don't think they particularly care. Uh, I think the iPhone sells so well, the Apple Watch sells so well that they're so uh, laser focused, as they like to say on those devices. But I think this 2023 device that merges FaceTime, an Apple TV box and a HomePod uh, could be quite interesting depending on how they price it and depending on how unique the functionality is, right? It would be sort of a leapfrog product that Amazon, Google have not really uh, perfected or done anything close to at this point. Um, Get any question here. What do you think happened with all the wrong leaks this time? Um, you know, in terms of the wrong leaks, you're going to see misinformation. You're going to see people report things uh, that are incorrect. Uh, every Apple product release cycle, it's just the nature of the beast. I've been covering the company since 2009. So what is it? 2021. So what, 11, 12 years at this point. And I've seen it all. I'm proud to say that I always do the best I can to get the most accurate information out there. And I think we did extraordinarily well this time from all the features uh, on the camera, the cinema mode, the ProRes mode, the photographic styles, uh, the smaller notch, the new processor core counts, um, the lack of major design changes, the new camera systems on all the new phones, uh, the storage capacities, the promotion. So I think we did great on the phone. Uh, the watch, I think we did great as well. Obviously, we got the exact screen resolutions. We got the new interface. We got all the new watch faces, all the software changes there. We had all the iPad OS and iOS 15 and Mac OS Monterey stuff. Uh, the one thing that we mentioned that didn't come to fruition was the flatter edges. Uh, obviously, there had been some design changes and some production delays due to the hardware. Obviously, that was a mistake. Hopefully, that uh launches uh you know in the future and i'm fully expecting we also got the ipad mini and the ipad 9 as well spot on the other thing i'm expecting are the airpods like i said to come toward the end of the year you'll see the macbook pro and some other mac related stuff uh in the next several weeks too so lots more to come throughout the end of the year and i'm extraordinarily excited to keep reporting on that and covering that and i appreciate everyone tuning in and you know always entrusting me with the, the latest apple info Great, why don't we do uh, one more from the stream here and we can check Twitter one more time. But in the meantime, I've got one from Maturis Paul who says, do you think India will be an important market for the sale of the new iPhones? Oof, well, what did stand out to me, which I thought was pretty interesting, were the price drops on the iPhone 11 and iPhone 12. The iPhone 12 now is $599. For the functionality, uh, which is mostly what you're getting on the iPhone 13 as well, that's, I think, a pretty damn good price. I think the iPhone SE price is still quite aggressive. I think the phone that's going to really be a big hit in India is going to be the iPhone, the current iPhone SE next year, because they're going to come out with a 5G iPhone SE with some screen changes and such next year. When they do that, they're going to drop the price of this iPhone SE, whether through Apple officially or carriers and such when they're trying to dwindle down inventory so that i think the current se next year is the one to watch with that price drop where they can get to the sub 300 i think that could be very strong in india i also you know it's not an apple's culture to do this but i always thought they should do sort of like a very low end phone specific to those emerging markets parts of china parts of india other parts of eastern europe i think it could be a huge success if they do a 200 dollars 250 dollars phone into the iOS ecosystem, rely on generating revenue from services. Uh, I would strongly behoove over lunch, Tim Cook to do that. Not that he needs my business advice. 
<laughs> do you think that so that would open them up to a set of consumers that isn't just waiting for their prices to drop, but might not otherwise interact with the company? Absolutely, because right now what you're seeing is people waiting for price drops and those devices till they get to the right prices are three or four generations old, right? Mm -hmm. What you want is a new generation product that meets the price point for your consumer. Yeah, our commenter here was actually noting that in his observation, a lot of uh, folks he knows in India are still using the iPhone 10 or the iPhone X. I'm not sure which I should call it. <laughs> the iPhone 10. This is a good one from Demetrio. Why did Apple choose to advertise the iPhone 13 with the delivery guy on a scooter despite news of motorcycle vibrations damaging the camera? You'll have to ask their marketing department. Sometimes they're not talking to their engineering department as much as they uh, as they should. Let's find one good, uh, one more good serious question, uh, Susie, shall we? Let me take one let's more. Let's do that. From here. Uh, let's see. Looking through. Uh, well, Mark is searching. I'll tell you one more time if you want to sign up for his newsletter. It's called Power On. You can go to Bloomberg.com slash newsletters to find that. It'll hit your inbox every Sunday. If you're a Bloomberg.com subscriber, you will get it early and get full access to a weekly Q&A with Mark. So here's a question. Um, what's the difference between the iPhone 13 Pro and the iPhone 13 uh, Pro Max? Is it only a matter of size? I have to check. I believe some of the camera specs are a bit different as well in terms of the uh, the sensor size. And then obviously the camera software is the same. The ProRes is the same. So yeah, I think it comes down to um, screen size. But I will, I will look into it and get back to you on Twitter. That is actually a very good question. But I did notice 13 Pro Max is a bit thicker, very slightly thicker than the uh, 12 Pro Max. So something to look out for if you have cases that you want to reuse and such. So. Great. Well, Mark, thanks for chatting today. Thank you to everyone for tuning in and all the great questions. If you uh, have anything you didn't get answered, just keep bugging Mark on Twitter and he'll get Please. them into the newsletter to, to power on bloomberg.com slash newsletters. Look for power on sign up there. Mark, thanks so much for chatting today and um, good luck writing up the rest of the conference. Thank you, Susie. See you next time. Hopefully we can do this again in October, November with the next event.